In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. It feels endless now, doesn't it? The lockdown. We are weary, fed up of it, we've had enough. It is dreary. The same few places, the same few people, no matter how much we love them. The endless Zoom calls and the tedious Teams meetings. In 1902, the Central European poet Rainer Maria Rilke visited the small zoo in the Botanic Garden Jardin des Plantes in Paris. One of the animals pacing in the cages there was a panther. It inspired one of Rilke's most famous poems. And here's the translation by Stephen Mitchell. The Panther. His vision from the constantly passing bars has grown so weary that it cannot hold anything else. It seems to him there are a thousand bars, and behind the bars, no world. As he paces in cramped circles over and over, the movement of his powerful soft strides is like a ritual dance around a center in which a mighty will stands paralyzed. Only at times the curtain of the pupils lifts quietly. An image enters in, rushes down through the tensed arrested muscles, plunges into the heart and is gone. We are not caged by bars, but our lives are caged. The same few places, the same few people, no matter how much we love them, the endless Zoom calls and the tedious Teams meetings. But there is hope. Images can enter between the bars. There can be moments of revelation. Moments of revelation like those experienced by the prophets, like Malachi in today's first reading, like the prophet Anna in the the gospel. By our baptism, all of us are called to be prophets, priests, kings. You and I are called to be prophets just as much as Malachi or Anna or Simeon. Malachi is the last of the prophets in the Hebrew scriptures, but he is firmly in Hebrew's prophetic tradition. He is the successor of Isaiah and Jeremiah, of Ezekiel and Haggai. Lots of Christians are disappointed in their prayer lives because they think there is something extraordinary about mystical experiences, about the spiritual gifts, including prophecy as if these gifts were something strange, something reserved to the famous prophets, to times past. But just look closely at what the prophets do. Like the panther pacing in his cage, they glimpse what lies between the bars. They see the world, the actual world, and they read it theologically. They understand it in the context of faith and speak of it with the language of believing. For Jeremiah, it's the boiling pot. For Hosea, it's his failing marriage, his unfaithful wife, who some of us have been hearing rather a lot about at morning prayer this week. For Malachi, it's the refiner purifying gold and silver. To be the prophets of our own lives is to take the ordinary stuff of our day-to-day existence and to understand it theologically, to describe it in the language of faith. How do you spend your money? Who have you fallen out with? What do you resent? Who annoys you? What are the unexpected things in your life? Earlier this year, I heard the Archbishop of York say to a group of priests that the most useful thing we could show our spiritual directors was our bank statements. Don't ask God to appear in a blaze of light. Ask God what he is telling you in your diary. 
your emails, how you spend your money. Over the last few months, I've been rereading Susan Howitcher's novels about the Church of England. They are not especially fashionable at the moment, but I really do recommend looking at them again or for the first time if you don't, don't know them. They're written in a blockbuster novel style and are an easy read, and yet I think they are significant. Howitch is brilliant at showing how impossible it is to understand reality and the complexity of human life in only one way, only one dimension. We need a variety of narratives if we are to avoid self-delusion and grow in maturity. Howitch shows how our personal narratives can be unpeeled like an onion, how our own accounts of ourselves need balancing with other people's realities. She is superb at illustrating how psychological narratives are profoundly helpful in dissecting our self-delusions and self-centeredness. But she also shows the limits of our ability to understand things only rationally and the necessity for religious language and experience. She never says, this narrative is true, that narrative is false. For her, spiritual realities are deeply true, and so are other narratives. And she's brilliant at exposing power and the shadows that lie behind glamour. For her, we live in a world of many powers, not all of them good. On Friday, I was the speaker at the school assembly for our cathedral school on Zoom, inevitably, and I showed the pupils this statue, which I have in the oratory in the cellar of the sub-deanery. The oratory is dedicated to St. Joseph, and this is a statue of a sleeping St. Joseph. Clearly, it is St. Joseph asleep, but I prefer to call it the dreaming St. Joseph. And in the first two chapters of Matthew's Gospel, Joseph has four dreams. Take a look at them. Most people can't list all four. And I encourage the pupils in our school to enjoy their dreams and to pay attention to them. Anna and Simeon were dreamers. They had dreamed the dream of a Messiah. Like all dreamers, they were ready for the unexpected. They had eyes that could see Jesus when he was brought into the temple. They had beginner's mind. They were open to possibilities. To be a dreamer is to be open to our imaginations, to be those who trust the many-layered nature of reality, the multiple narratives we need to make sense of our lives, to allow ourselves to be changed and transformed. To be a dreamer is also to be open to the nightmares of life. When Simeon looks through the bars, he sees the sword that will pierce Mary's heart. If Wherever you are, your prayer seems dry. If you are not glimpsing the world beyond the bars, use your imagination. Don't worry so much about whether it is just imagination. Just is such a poisonous word. Allow God to speak to you through your imagination. Imagine God speaking to you. Like Susan Howitch, allow yourself the possibility that there are many ways of describing the reality of your life. Reflect on your life prophetically. Abandon the lie that events are random and meaningless. And imagine that all the events of your life reflect spiritual realities. Anna and Simeon were ready and prepared. It can't be that they had not thought of the presence of God in their lives until this day in their old age when Kapow, the Messiah, appears. They were ready for Jesus, 
ready to recognize him immediately because they had been looking for God in every event of their lives, every encounter, looking, finding, seeing. To live without this spiritual muscle is to see only the bars of our cages, not just the cages of lockdown, but the cages of everything that diminishes and hinders our lives. It is as if our mighty wills are paralyzed, our powers bound. Dear friends, my prayer for you this week, for all of us, is that we will dream dreams, that in our prayer, our imaginations will run wild, and that in the cage of this lockdown, the images we see between the bars will plunge into our hearts. His vision from the constantly passing bars has grown so weary that it cannot hold anything else. It seems to him there are a thousand bars, and behind the bars, no world. As he paces in cramped circles over and over, the movement of his powerful soft strides it's like a ritual dance around a center in which a mighty will stands paralyzed. Only at times the curtain of the pupils lifts quietly. An image enters in, rushes down through the tensed arrested muscles, plunges into the heart. and is gone.